right, well, Acts chapter number 8 in your Bibles, Acts chapter 8, sure you appreciate the singing this morning, and um, you know, singing does a lot for you to prepare your heart for the message and, uh, and get you ready for it. Somebody says, well, singing has a lot of emotion, I don't think emotion, well, the, there was a lot of emotion attached to the way music played a part in the life of David. Uh, and Saul, when Saul was having problems, David would come and minister to him with music, and it would do something to his spirit, help him, and, um, and it does something to us. Not only that, but it also glorifies God and points us towards God, and there's several things to be said about music, but I'm thankful we're in a place we have people that are gifted, that are using their gifts and talents for the Lord just to glorify Him and help our spirit, and so thank you for everybody that was involved in that today. Acts chapter number 8, I'm going to preach a sermon to you about believer's baptism and uh, hopefully this will be a help to you, and um, answer some questions. I've had a lot of questions about it. Uh, people have asked me some things lately about, well, if there's spiritual baptism, what's the need in water baptism? What, uh, how many baptisms are there? There's several in the Bible. The word baptism only means immersion. It means to be baptized or immersed into something. So when you see the word baptism, most of the time what we always think is we think every time you see the word baptism, it means water. It doesn't. It's, there's, sometimes it means water, sometimes it means other things. Um, there's at least six different baptisms in the New Testament of the Bible, um, and uh, I, I just read off some of them. I think it's Matthew chapter number 20. You can even go get an, an old dictionary, and when, he, when you see the word baptism in the dictionary, one of the definitions for baptism will be immersed into the sufferings of Christ. It has nothing to do with water. That's the spot where uh, Jesus' disciples said, uh, can we sit on your left and your right? And Jesus said, can you be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with? And they said, we can. He said, you shall be. And what he was talking about was not water. They'd already been baptized in water. He was talking about the sufferings of Christ, being immersed into the sufferings of Christ. There's one baptism right there. Matthew, in Matthew chapter number 3, um, John the Baptist is speaking. He says, I'm not even worthy to latch the shoes of Jesus. He says, uh, I came baptize him in water, but he should be bab baptized with the Holy Ghost and with fire. There's three baptisms right there. There's a baptism of water that, that, that John was doing. There's a baptism of the Holy Spirit of God and a baptism of fire. Now, if somebody was to say, well, with those three baptisms, they're all the same. They can't be all the same, number one. Number two, um, somebody says, well, I'm looking forward to the baptism of fire. You really don't want that baptism. You, how would you clarify it? The next verse down clarifies it, talks about that uh, the wheat will be gathered in, but a chaff will be thrown into a fire to destroy it. Well, that clarifies, the verse below that clarifies that, and says so there's going to be a baptism that's, uh, that's the Holy Spirit bringing those people that are His to Him, and the other ones are being immersed into fire at some time in the future. So there's three different baptisms there, and so now we've got four baptisms listed right here, and we haven't even gone very far in any explanation at all. There's multiple times in here. We may look, time permitting, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and it's going to talk about the baptism of Moses when they came out of Israel and they crossed the Red Sea. Now, it didn't mean that when those millions of people got on the other side that Moses stopped and dunked every one of them in water. It doesn't mean that. It's a picture of them leaving their old life behind, following a new leader. That's a picture of baptism. And so that's the different times that word is used. It's meaning, in that case, being immersed into a new leadership, a new way of life. And so you'll see it. When you look through your Bible and you read the word baptism, you always, and this is the case with anything you read in your Bible, you've always got to look at context. You've always got to look at what is it talking about, what is surrounding it. If you mess up some of these, then you have false doctrine that you'll be teaching before too long. And so you've got to look at them. Look at Acts chapter 8, and let's read through this account of a baptism and see if we can draw some encouragement for ourselves from this. In uh, Acts chapter 8, in verse number uh, 26, Acts chapter number 8, verse number 26. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go towards the south, unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem, unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, thank God for that. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, an eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah the prophet. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read 
the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this, He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. That's Isaiah 53. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away, and who shall declare his generation, for his life is taken from the earth? And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came into a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Obviously, this man is a is a um, is somebody that's from Ethiopia. He's traveled to Jerusalem. He's become some kind of at some point convert, con- converted to to uh, Judaism, and he's following some of those things. So he's come for some kind of uh, ritual, some kind of feast, some kind of ceremony to uh, Jerusalem, and he's on his way back. Somehow along there, he must have heard about baptism there while he's there. So he's cruising along, he's in his chariot, he's reading some kind of scroll that has Isaiah 53, and he's gotten his mind stirring about what is baptism. I've seen it, I've heard about it. And so he gets to this place, and Philip is going to preach to him Jesus. And as he gets to the end of preaching Jesus, he says, well, there, there's water here. Am I eligible to be baptized? Can I get baptized as well? What hinders me from doing it? And the great verse that, to be honest with you, uh, I don't want to insult you, but if you've got uh, some of the newer Bibles, this verse is just flat out missing in your Bible. It'll be 34, 35, 36, 38, 39, 40. It won't even have a 37. And it says, And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Extremely crucial verse in your Bible um, that you have to be a believer before baptism. And so I want to look at this for a minute with you and help us maybe get something from this that will be a blessing and a help to us. Number one, the first thing I want you to see is the messenger in the story. Um, Philip is the messenger, and Philip had been in Samaria and seeing, boy, a lot of revival take place in Samaria, but the Holy Spirit has told him, go stand next to this roadway in the desert and be in this place. Why, Lord? Doesn't tell him why. But, but, but Lord, I'm seeing great things happen here. Didn't ask him what, is, what was going on back here. Just ask him to be obedient, to go stand in a place because God knew. Now, Philip might not have known, but God knew that he'd be sending somebody along the way that had a question about these things, and he wanted one of his people to be in the way ready. And I'm glad that, that, uh, that the example is you, when God says, arise and go, that the example is he arose and went. He went to some place, God, you say, well, does that mean I have to go to Africa? No, it could mean that you need to go down to the local uh, street corner or the local restaurant or at your job or at school and tell somebody about Jesus Christ. And so that's just a rise and win. So that's the first, the messenger. The second thing I want you to see in verse number 27 is the man that he went to. This is interesting when you look at it. He arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia. That's the first thing I want you to get is that it was just a single man from a place. Now, up to this point, if you go back in Acts chapter 2, 3,000 people got saved. In Acts chapter number 4, 5,000, just men counted, got saved. In Acts chapter 5, multitudes got saved. In Acts chapter 6, a great company of the priests got saved. In Acts chapter 8, a, a whole city in Samaria got saved. But now you're seeing God deal with an individual. Now, this is what you might think. Well, God so loved the world that He's interested in the world being saved. And God's interested in missionaries all over the world to try to reach the gospel all over the world. But God's not interested in just me. The problem is we sometimes get to think that way. God is interested in saving the world, but God is also interested in saving each individual in this world. It doesn't matter where they come from, what their background is, what color they are, what, where, where they're at in life. It makes no difference. God's interested in saving them. And so you see that, that God sent a man to a place to be there for one person. And that's important. Not only that, he's an Ethiopian man. And so you may be somebody that, as far as we can understand, this man would have been probably not the same color, skin color, uh, same background as Philip. 
Now, let me tell you, in some of our circles, that would stop us from going. You said, well, I've got these guys that are kind of look more like me. I'll stay in this area and talk to them. But I'm not going down on that corner. I'm not going to be on that street to see that guy. He's not like me. He's not from the same background. He's not the same skin color. All that stuff needs to be thrown out. I read it to you the other day in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 16. It says this, Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, net now henceforth know we him no more. Meaning this, now that we've been saved, it's no more about, well, I'm a Jew and you're a Gentile. I'm white, you're black. I'm black, you're white. You're this, I'm that. You're Hispanic, you're a Democrat, you're a Republican. None of that stuff matters. That's just a bunch of garbage. That doesn't matter anywhere. So what we're supposed to be doing now is it doesn't matter where the person comes from, what side of the tracks they grew up on. They're all somebody that Jesus Christ died for that we need to get the gospel to. And so you see that. You see him going. And not only that, but he's not only an Ethiopian, he's a eunuch. He's a eunuch. Now, I'll let you parents go home and figure that one out, how you can explain all that to him. But you can look up in the dictionary and see what it is. It just means he did not have any of those organs anymore. We'll put it that way. And so this is a person that normally what they would do that with is somebody that was in charge of ladies or worked with ladies in a kingdom to keep them from having any kind of uh, connection with them. So not only is this man not of the same skin color, maybe, not of the same background, but watch this now. He's of a completely different I mean, the way of life is completely different. Now, I want you to get a hold of that for a minute. And I want you to understand that you need to be prepared to go to anybody, anywhere, and give every one of them the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Doesn't matter if you say, well, I don't have anything in common. I'm, I guarantee you, Philip had nothing in common with this man. You don't have to have anything in common about hunting or fishing or race cars or, or, or guns or bows or whatever. You don't have to have any of that stuff in common. What do you have in common? A lost condition and needing a Savior. And so you go to him. You go to him. And so he went to this person, this uh, Ethiopian. It's a eunuch. He had wealth. He was an, of an authority. You say, well, I don't fit in that class. Well, you still, you say, well, I don't have anything in common. You still have something that you could talk about, and that is Jesus Christ. This man was obviously being dealt with by God because something's going on in his mind that he's actually reading the book of Isaiah setting there. And God is interested in verse 29 of the Spirit putting Philip together with this man. God is doing something. God's working in Philip to try to get Philip to the place of preaching to this guy, but God's also working in the life of this Ethiopian eunuch to get him to the place. So both places, the Spirit of God's working to bring these two people together. Now, that's the messenger and the man. I want you to look at the main message. What is the message? The message is not baptism. The message is Jesus Christ. And I want you to see it. Look at verse number 30. He ran, and this man's in this chariot, and he's reading Isaiah and he's reading a certain part of Isaiah. In verse 32, it says the place in the Scripture where he read, and he, he goes through it. Now, that's, it's verse 7 and 8 of Isaiah 53. But I'm going to read this to you, and I want you to hear what he's reading. What this man's got in his mind, he's rehearsing, trying to figure out who's being talked about here. And I want you to see, Isaiah 53, 3, it says, He was despised and rejected of men. Jesus. A man of sorrows, we just sang about it and acquainted with grief, Jesus. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken and smitten of God and afflicted, Jesus. But he was wounded for our transgressions, Jesus. He was bruised for our iniquity, it's Jesus. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed, that's Jesus. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all, Jesus. He was oppressed and he was afflicted and yet opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before his shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. Remember, when he's standing before Pilate, he wouldn't answer. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. 
And the man says, who's he talking about? Now, even today, a Jewish person would look at that and think they're talking about the nation of Israel. So I'd say, well, they always knew about the Messiah. They did not always know. In fact, even if they thought this was Messiah, the problem they would have is, wait a minute, the Messiah is coming and going to be beaten and afflicted. They didn't see that. But here he is explaining that that is what Jesus came to do. And he preaches to him Jesus. And evidently, at some point in this, this, this uh, Ethiopian eunuch becomes a believer. And so the Ethiopian eunuch, somehow he understood that people are getting baptized, and he comes to this water along the way and says, here's water, what doth hinder me to be baptized? And that's where we come to the lesson for today about baptism. And the message I want you to get is it, did, it is not a message of baptism, it's a message of belief. I was on a street corner one time where you guys were at, and a, a person pulled over one time and they asked me, they said, how come you're preaching that, it's, that it's, you get saved by belief and you're not putting baptism as part of it? And I said, well, baptism is not part of your salvation. It's something that's done after salvation. And oddly enough, it was very interesting, the person went to Acts chapter number 8 in their Bible and they said, the man in verse 36 said, uh, there's water, what doth Henry be baptized? And then he read verse 38 and said, the commanded, they commanded the chariot to stand still and went down and baptized him. He said, see there, that's, that's, that's baptism is for salvation. I said, wait a minute, let me see your Bible. Do you not have verse 37? You know what, I never even thought about this. I don't have verse 37 in my Bible. I said, verse 37 is crucial. I opened it up and showed him. What do you have to have before you get baptized? You've got to become a believer before you get baptized. And so when he saw that, he said, I never saw that before. And that is the, that's the message. That's what we're trying to give people. Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 1.17, Watch this now. The greatest, the greatest preacher of the New Testament outside Jesus Christ made this statement. 1 Corinthians 1.17 For Christ sent me not to baptize. Now, that's, that's crazy. Wait a minute. I thought baptism saved you. And the greatest preacher of the New Testament said, Christ did not send me to baptize. He said, but to preach the gospel. Not with the wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ be made of none effect. Baptism does not save anybody Faith, belief in Jesus Christ is what saves people. Baptism comes after your belief in Jesus Christ. And so let's look at this a little bit this morning, maybe try to help you understand it. In the New Testament, when you read it, baptism always came after someone believed. The first thing I want you to get in this is this. Why did a person get baptized? Number one is this. Because it is the plan of God for all new converts to be baptized. It's the plan of God for all new converts to be baptized. Baptism is something that, that John the Baptist began to do to herald Jesus Christ coming. Jesus did it. His disciples were baptized. Any of the disciples that, that uh, Jesus' disciples had, they baptized them, John chapter number 4. And then Jesus commanded as he left to go into all the world and preach the gospel and to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. So there is a need for going and baptizing. So number one, it's the plan of God. So if you're a new convert, the plan of God for your life is that you get baptized after you have been saved. Number two, number one, it's the plan. Number two, it was practiced, once you get this now, it was practiced by all new believers in the Bible. All new believers in the Bible were baptized. Look back at Acts chapter number 2. Let's go back there. Acts chapter number 2. I tell people this all the time because depending on where you came from, you can get confused fairly easily about baptism. Acts chapter number 2 and verse number 40, 41. Watch what it says. Baptism always comes after belief. Acts chapter 2 verse 41. Then they that gladly received His word were baptized. Baptism always comes after belief. Look at Acts chapter number 8. Watch Acts 8. Go to Acts 8, verse number 12. Acts chapter 8, verse number 12. Acts 8, verse number 12. And when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God, and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized. Belief comes before baptism, both men and women. Look at Acts, well, we're in Acts chapter number 8, in verse number 30 through 38. 
Philip asked him, do you believe? He said, I believe. Then he could be baptized. Acts chapter number 10. Acts chapter number 10, and look at verse number 47. This man becomes a believer. And uh, 1 through 46 is, the, is his conversion of belief. Verse 47, Can any man forbid water that these should be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. Belief always comes before baptism. Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. Say, why are you hammering this home? Because there's whole groups out there that are baptizing people before they ever get saved. Acts chapter 16, look at verse number 30. Acts chapter 16, verse number 30. This is the Philippian jailer. It says in verse number 30, And brought them out and said, Sirs, this is the jailer, what must I do to be saved? And they said, what? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord and all that were in his house. And he took him the same hour of night and washed their stripes and was baptized, he and all his, straightway. Baptism always comes after belief. When you find it in the Bible, it's always after. Now somebody, when you talk to people a lot, you end up asking them questions like, have you ever trusted Christ your Savior? When did you become a Christian? When did you become a believer? And inevitably a lot of people will end up saying, well, I got baptized whenever I was whatever. And the question you've got to kind of get to with people is, it's not a matter of when did you get dunked in water, it's a matter of when did you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. That's the matter. It's not baptism. I had a lady one time, and, I, and I, again, these are things people just don't understand. So when I'm saying this, I'm not being uh, insulting to you. I'm just telling you, people don't understand this because churches are teaching false doctrine all over the place. People get this and they get completely messed up and they don't know. So I had a lady one time, she came in and she brought her uh, little girl and she was first time here. She came in, it was in the other building, stood off to the side and she said, I'm here, I want to get my child baptized. And then I said, well, has she accepted Christ? And she said, well, she's a good girl. She goes to camp every year. I said, well, I understand and I'm not saying she's not a good girl, but has she put her faith and trust in Jesus Christ? She said, she goes to church all the time. And I said, well, I mean, I understand that, and I, might, and I actually, I felt like she was on the defense, and I felt like she was upset by what I was asking, so what I actually did, it was crazy, I felt like at the time, I actually got on the floor, because they wouldn't stand up, they were sitting in a chair, I got on the floor and, and got on my knees so I could get low enough, I thought if I'll get lower, maybe they'll feel like I'm not over the top of them, breathing down their necks, saying this stuff, and I got down there, I tried to explain it and tried to show up in the Bible, and the lady got very, very upset. She said, I just want you to baptize my child. And I said, but the problem with that is, is down the road, if your child has never understood that faith is in Jesus Christ, then she'll trust that baptism as what she got saved, and that will be a false conversion because the baptism can't save anybody. It's got to be faith in Jesus Christ. I said, I don't want to set this young lady up to where if somebody asks her down the road, when did you trust Christ? How do you know? You know, people struggle with their salvation all the time. You say, how do you know that you're a child of God? You'll know by you putting your faith in Christ and Him alone. Not anything, listen, not anything that I can do, not anything that our church can do, but it's something between your heart and God and you recognizing I'm a lost sinner, separated from God, and I put my faith and trust in the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ to save my soul from my sins. That's it. When you get in this water, it does nothing but it's a, I'm going to give it to you in a minute, a public profession. So number three, you want to do it because it's the plan of God. Number two, you want to do it because it's practiced by every new believer in the New Testament. And number three, because it's a public profession. It shows publicly to everybody that's around you that you, your old person is gone and you're following a new leader. That's what you're doing. That's what you're doing publicly. You know, whenever we baptize somebody, when you look in the Bible, when you look at baptism in the Bible, it's always in water. There's never any place where you see sprinkling. And that's another thing that you see. Uh, we were in a church one time and visiting some family, and the, and the guy in uh, it was a different denomination group, and, and uh, the guy said, I was there, and I, I remember hearing him say this, and I thought it was funny. He said, we sprinkle people here. We don't baptize them. He said, now the Baptists, they baptize people by putting them under water. We sprinkle people. 
And he said, in case you're wondering, we do that because we don't want to mess anybody's hair up. And I thought, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my entire life. <laughs> but that's what he said. And, uh, but the, the issue is, when you see it in the Bible, listen, that's, you know what we are? We're people that are pursuing the Bible, right? When you look at it in the Bible, they always go down into water, and they come up out of water. That's what you see. And so it's always that. Now, here's the thing. When you get into water, sprinkling never pictures anything, but when you get in the water, you know what we're going to do in a little while, if we do the baptism in a little while, someone will, will be in that water, and they'll be alive. When I, when I did it, it was Eric stand, sitting in the water, standing in the water. Here's Eric. There's the, this is Eric Knight standing there. And the man would say, have you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ? Yes. And so what he's showing then is the old Eric died with Christ. When I put my faith in Christ, Christ died, buried, and rose again. You know what I'm saying? My old life has been crucified with Christ. I'm buried with Him. My old life is gone, dead, buried, and I'm raising up with Jesus Christ, walking in a new life. That's pictured publicly in baptism. That's what that pictures. And so that's what you have when you're publicly doing that. Folks, the gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And when you're saying publicly, I've accepted the gospel, baptism follows showing people that the old life is gone, a new life is risen. I didn't know anything about baptism. I didn't know anything about church. I didn't know about anything about anything when I got saved. And I got saved in Hawaii and then got sent to Fort Littlewood, Missouri. And, uh, and I went to a church there. And when I got there, they asked me, have you been saved? They said, yes, you've been baptized. I said, no. And the guy said, you want to get baptized? I said, well, yeah, I guess so. He explained it to me, and, and I got in the baptistry with him. I didn't know anything about what I was doing. I think I had some swim trunks on, and I got in the baptistry with him, and, and he got in there with me. He had hip waders on. And so he's in there with the hip waders, and I'm in the water with him. And, uh, and I'm not a little guy. I'm not huge, but I'm not a little guy. And well, I didn't know what I was doing. So whenever he went to dunk me backwards in the water, he just said, we're going to take you down and take you back up. I was like, all right, no big deal. So when he went to take me down the water, I just let my feet go and just flip back in the water. And I'd never even seen baptism done before. And when I did, this huge wave of water from my body mass went up, went over the baptistry wall and the choir, and then came back and went over his hip waders and filled him up to his, about his calves with water and his hip waders. He said, that's the first time ever that I've ever babbed anybody that I got wet like I did today. I didn't know anything about it, and most people don't. I'm just I'm using myself as a humorous illustration to show you that most people don't understand this. You only know what you've been told in circles someplace. And so we're trying to give you what the Bible actually says so that you can understand why we even do what we do. Yeah. Most people are trying to figure out, why do we do what we do? Is this a, just a ritual that you have in your church? Is this to become a Baptist? I promise you this, getting baptized has nothing to do with you becoming a Baptist. Yeah. Nothing to do with the domination at all. I had somebody say one time that Jesus Christ went in 70 miles and he traveled to go get baptized of John the Baptist because he wanted to become the first independent Baptist. And I'm like, that is just dumb. I mean, that is just, that is just, that don't even make sense. And that's the, that's the problem that sometimes we have, even in our circles, is we're misrepresenting what is clearly in the Bible. And so we're trying to help you see what it actually says in the Bible. It's something that happens publicly. That's why I quoted you 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Nobody got baptized in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 by being immersed in water. What, they were, what he's saying in 1 Corinthians 10 is he's connecting you and saying, just like, the, like Israel crossed through that, that Red Sea under that cloud and then started following a new leader and left their old life behind, he links that to a type of baptism in the sense that you're saying publicly, my old life is gone and my new life is following Christ. And I'm publicly saying that. That's what we're saying in this baptism. Fourth is this. It pictures what took place at baptism. And that's what I said already in the death, the burial, and the resurrection. You know that 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Your old life is passed away. Your new life is risen. I don't know how many of you are married. You have a wedding ring on your finger. But it's almost like a wedding ring. The wedding ring is an outward symbol of an inward commitment and covenant, right? You know, it'd be silly to put an outward symbol on someone that's never made the inward covenant. 
It would make sense, right? The outward symbol always comes after the inward covenant. And so the inward commitment you make to Jesus Christ, outwardly we're showing something in baptism, and that's what we're doing. Now, somebody might say this, how should we baptize? Well, we've talked about it a little bit plainly here, that you go down into the water to be baptized. Several places in the Bible where that's what they said. When should I get baptized? When you look at it, they're always baptized as soon as possible after they've accepted Christ as their personal Savior. And then somebody says, well, what about infant baptism? The problem with infant baptism is you don't find anybody baptizing any infants anywhere in the Bible at all. That is something that's connected to a, a, a religious group. It has nothing to do. I asked, in fact, I had a meeting with one one time, and I had enough of a, of a time that I could talk to them, and I asked them, what do you do about infant baptism? They said, well, we baptize infants. And I said, well, why do you baptize an infant? He said, well, what we're doing is the parents have made a profession, and the parents are Christians, and so what we're doing is we're baptizing them with the church, and we're connecting them with their parents under that grace in case something happens to them. I said, all right, let me ask you a question. What if a, an infant passes away, God forbid, and they're not, they haven't been sprinkled by you at your church? Said, well, they're still under that grace. Based on what? Well, I would say based on Romans chapter 5, when there is no knowledge of sin, I mean, no knowledge of the law, no sin is imputed. When somebody doesn't know the difference between right and wrong, no sin is imputed to that person. And so that's where I would base that off of. He didn't use that verse, but that's what I would base it off of. And he said they're already under grace. He said, well, then why, if they're still, whether they do it or not, why do it? He goes, well, it, just, it brings peace of mind to people. Well, I said, let me ask you a question. Do you think it's damaging? No, I don't think it's damaging at all. I said, you know how many people I've talked to that told me they know they're going to heaven because when they were an infant, they were sprinkled? Or an infant, they were dunked in water? It has nothing to do with that. And that's what I said, number one. Number two, I said, where do you find it anywhere in the Bible? He, you're still probably in Acts chapter 16, when it says he baptized him and all his straightway, he said, there's got to be a baby in there somewhere. That's what he said. And I said, so you're basing baptism of a baby on the fact that all his, him and all his straight way and all his house. And he said, yes. And I said, that's pretty loose. There's, not, there's no Bible for any of this. Folks, you know what you have clear Bible for? A person needs to put their faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. After they do that, they publicly show that their old life is gone and their new life is walking with Christ. They publicly do that. And that's what we do here. And you say, well, I'd rather do it down at a, at a river. Well, I, I think it'd be great to do it there as well. And so you don't have to do it here. This doesn't make you, the other thing is, it doesn't make you a Baptist. Another thing is, it doesn't make you part of this church. You say, well, I thought that being baptized made you part of that church. What church was the Ethiopian eunuch baptized into? He wasn't part of any church. Baptism doesn't make you part of a church. Your agreement to be part of that church makes you part of that church. Baptism is just the first step of showing that I am a new convert in Christ. So it's not part of your salvation, but it is a part of the plan of God. It's a public profession. It pictures it as well. All right, let's, uh, let's do this. Let's, we're going to have a baptism here in just a second. And so what we're going to do is I'm going to give you a chance to pray this morning, talk to God a little bit. If you're not saved, you never trusted Christ your Savior, this would be a good time to get that part settled. So you're putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ to save you. Um, and then uh, we do have at least one person that I've talked to. You say, well, I want to get baptized. Well, what I would ask you to do is come and see me, and let's talk about it and make sure you understand salvation, and then let's move to the baptism part after that. And we can do that anytime you want to do that. Uh, somebody told me the other day they wanted to do it, and I think we're going to do it this morning. And so praise the Lord for this person. We filled it up yesterday. It stayed filled up, and the heater ran all night. So it won't be ice cold this time, so I'll be a blessing. I know TNT is probably upset about that up there. But, um, but we'll, we'll do that in just a minute. And so if you're not saved, get saved. You are saved. Let's start living a life that's following Christ in obedience to him. Let's stand to our feet. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your mercy, your grace, your goodness. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth that's found in it. And Father, I pray that in some way or in this message, somebody would have received something. Lord, whether they're saved and baptized and are living for you, they need to be obedient to your spirit to be a witness everywhere you send them to go. It doesn't matter who the person is, but being a witness. And if they're not saved and they're like the Ethiopian eunuch, 
they need to trust you as their Savior. And if there's someone that has trusted you but never followed you afterwards, I pray you'd work in their heart as, for that as well. Uh, Lord, just do a work in each person's life. I've, I've tried to just be true to your word. I pray that your Holy Spirit would now make application to their heart. Bless us now and help us in Jesus' name. Amen. And she's going to play, give you a chance to come pray about anything you want to pray about. You can come and do that. 